Hey, thank you for tuning in to The Right Hook Show. We're here at Vibes on 8th Street, getting ready to interview two great DC native folks. We got Daryl Tyson, our native champion, boxing champion, and we got Andre Johnson from Rare Essence. So sit back, stay tuned, and we'll be right back on The Right Hook Show. About to show these little you should stay and learn. stay and learn. Turned up in the club, nigga. You know I came here with baby girl. Baby girl. A B A B I E. Everything foreign. We ain't even Chinese. Box I stand bread like nine feet. And I wish you would try to try me. I be there with baby. I be there with baby. Yeah, I be there with baby. I be there with baby. Yeah, I be there with baby. I be there with baby. Yeah, I be there with baby. So you can stop the hate. Now. She's a boxing promoter, and you know a soldier. She Hello, thank you for tuning in to The Right Hook Show. I'm your host, Cassandra White. Man, we got a very special guest here today. I'm so excited. We have the one, the only, <laughs> DC champion, Daryl Tyson. What's up, Daryl? Always a pleasure. I mean, I'm so honored to have you, because I've been trying to get you for the longest on the interview. It's my honor to be here. Now, you came in before, I, let me take that back, because you did show up one time with your kids, because you had a right. great program. Right. You were them. You, it wasn't about you, it was about the kids right, at that exactly. time. So now I get the pleasure of interviewing you today. Okay. So let, um, where did you grow up? Washington, D.C. So you are a native Washingtonian? Yeah, yes, I am. And what? Street, Handover Street. Really? Third P Street, <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you this. When you got into boxing, did, did you just start automatically, like today's boxers, are not really getting that amateur career. You know, they may take right. three fights as amateurs right. then jumping over into the pro. Was you, did you have a long amateur career? Well, I had uh, my amateur record was forty and ten, so I, that I was pursued a long, it as a long amateur career. So after that, I went on and graduated from high school, and I thought maybe I need some money, so I turned pro. I did go two months of uh, college, but I need some money. Really? Where did you go to college? In UDC. Really? Yeah. What would you major in? Then? Uh, nothing real heavy or whatever, because mm -hmm. my mind would lean on the yeah, the study. education thing right now. Just on me getting some money and mm -hmm, taking mm -hmm. care of my mother and my family. And that was the reason you went into that. Yes, that was wow. That's crazy. I mean, yes, that's and then and and you that was your goal, and you did so well at it. Um, so when you uh, first uh, started your professional boxing career. Mm -hmm. Um, was it any nerves? I mean, what was it like doing that? Jumping out of well, amateur into that pro? Well, well, well it's all, you're going to always have nervousness, you know what I mean? But you're not scared or nothing like that. You're just nervousness because you want to fight and be dedicated mm -hmm. to the things that you're doing with the boxing because it's very hard. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. very hard for a boxer to be dedicated and do the things he needs to do for himself. And you know what? I was looking over, doing some research on you, and I saw that you were a former WBC. Let me get all this stuff correct. That's why I wrote it down. WBC <laughs> Continental America's Champion, uh, USBA, and NABF Champion in the lightweight division. Yeah. I mean, that must have taken some dedication. I mean, when, when you're going out for these uh, belts, what is the... The, the, the requirements in terms of trying to get your body, your mind ready for, for that? Well, first, it's all about conditioning of the mind, body, and soul. It's all about focusing on the things that you're supposed to be doing as far as a fighter and taking care of yourself uh, naturally, which is what I've done and, you know, through my whole boxing career. I was very dedicated in things I was doing in my boxing career. So, therefore, when I had to fight and things come, I always stayed in. You never see me on the streets. You never see me at the go-go's and any of that. So mm -hmm. I was very dedicated to the things mm -hmm. I was doing with my mm -hmm. boxing career of uh, about 24 years of boxing. So I think I did pretty good for myself. Wow, that's 24 years. And when you started your professional career, what was the first boxer that you had to go up against? Oh, it's been so long. I think his name was... Uh, uh, Wayne Anderson. Really? I believe Wayne Anderson out down at the, uh, and I had a nice little turnout down there too, and I had 6 and K Street Northwest at a, um, they used to have the, uh, the games, the Pac-Man games and all that stuff they used to play down there. Really? Ago, and it was on the outside. Before and outside. It was, it was you guys fought outside? And yes, outside. It, was, it was right down there in Northeast, uh, off of First Street, uh, Northeast, yeah. Uh, so were a lot of your fights here local or 
when you when you won your, your belts, were they here locally or would you? No, they were in uh, uh, places like Atlanta City, um, uh, down in Texas, or uh, I, I don't know if that was, it wasn't Fort Worth, I think it was San Antonio, Texas. Uh, so you well, just so you did travel. You just yeah, it was well, all yeah. your fights were not here in nah, D.C. Nah, so fights, they no can't fights. say that you won because most, you were here in D.C. Right, you were the most of my fights was there in Atlanta City, New Jersey. Mm -hmm, yeah, so. mm -hmm. That was a that was a feat to to yeah, do that. That, you know? that was uh, that was it was it was very special to me, you know. And I always had my friends and fans to come up to see me fight. Did you, what, what, what about your mom? Did she enjoy you oh, boxing? My mother was something else, you know. Uh, so she, she, I, she, I think she went to all your shows. Yeah, but she acted like she, <laughs> she acted like she enjoyed it, right? But uh -huh. uh, after every fight, my sister would tell me she always talking about she need ten tickets to the fight and all this <laughs> and that, and she don't never see you fight. I say, well, I see all the little never fights, but you know your mother. Could never look at me fight. She always ran to the bathroom. I, I would think. When the fight was over, <laughs> when the fight was over, she the first one in the ring. And then do I say, where you been at? Oh, I just, I just can't take this. So you know, when, when you were a kid, when you were doing it in amateur, was she well, scared she, for she, you? Was, yeah, well, how she did she never really seen me fight, fight what? as an amateur. She knew I was fighting. And then when I told her I was going back to school and get my high school diploma and things like that, she mm -hmm. was very proud of me. Oh that. yeah, okay. Because I yeah. was the only. Would would you would say only man in my? Uh, I was gonna ask you about that. Like so how many how many sisters it and was, brothers? It was uh, uh, three more brothers over me, and then uh, four girls. So it was Ooh. eight of us. Yeah, and it Jesus. was two I didn't know before I came. Yes, yeah. so it was like ten of us. Yeah. Oh Lord, you had a large family, yeah. all in D.C. No, nah, well, well, D.C., Baltimore, and uh, North Carolina, Farmville, North Carolina. Oh, okay. Cause that's where my mother and father's originally from. And so they migrated up here in D.C. Yes. And well, they migrated up here in Baltimore first. Okay. Then they went to Virginia. Then they came to D.C. Well, you know, <laughs> like I said, I was doing the research on you, and I was impressed about to learn that you had all these notable fighters. You had mm -hmm. Oscar De La Hoya. Yeah. You had Roger Mayweather. Yeah. You had uh, Zab Judah. I mean, yeah. the list goes on and on. Right. So let me ask you this. From Let's take Oscar De La Hoya. Okay. One to ten. Okay. Ten being the toughest fight. Where does he line up there? Uh, <laughs> I would say maybe eight or nine. Okay. And the reason I would say that because uh, I've been through some trials and tribulations during that fight. Some mm -hmm. things that happened and you know my mind basically wasn't there but I went on to take the fight because uh, tax problems and mm -hmm. things like that so I went on to take the fight even though I got cussed out about it. But you know, it, it, it's okay that uh, my real, my real was real hurt. Mm -hmm. If you feel it right now, it's still out there. So mm -hmm. I went on and took the fight anyway, you know. And Oscar is really not a body puncher. Mm -hmm. So when he hit me to the body, like he ain't no body puncher. So it's mm -hmm. like if it was like he knew my ribs was messed up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. therefore, we took the fight, and I was so embarrassed when I went down on one knee and this and that. But it is what it is. So. So it was okay. Uh, so uh, that's interesting. You said that mm -hmm. in terms of the mental stability that y you can go into a ring and and be physically fit, obviously. but not mentally. But if you're not and, mentally, and it's, mental talk focus, about that. Take, mental talk focus, about that a little well, bit. It, it, some things have happened. No, no. In terms of not on one the specifics. I'm saying mm -hmm. that a boxer really needs to have his mental game on point. I, Exactly. And, uh, you, because you uh, people, Absolutely. the average person will be looking at them and say, "Well, you can go out and you know get you." And she's in shape, so you can. But if you're not mentally, because you got right. you got to think about that opponent, right? right? What what is, what is he's right. doing? Well, you got to have all uh, mentally, physically, and spiritually. And if it's not there mental, the rest is not gonna work anyway. I don't care how much condition you in, whatever. But if you're not there mentally, mm -hmm. it's not gonna work. Wow, it's not, it's not gonna work. Okay, it, 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 it got to be there all together. All right, now let's take um, Roger Mayweather. Same okay. thing, one to ten. Where do you put him at as the toughest fight? I, I mean, put, and for was that tough or I, oh. at that particular time, I put Roger at about number five. Number five. Because uh, <laughs> once again, I got cursed out for giving him about three or four pounds when I fought him, and uh, my promoter mm -hmm. uh, named oh. Tyrone Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> uh, jumped on me about giving him these pounds, you know, because I mm -hmm. said, well, Ty, he ain't in no shape, so I mean, we gonna get him, it's everything, right? Mm -hmm. They say, oh, man, you should have made him lose more weight, so 
you know, I've been in a fight went on and on. I caught Raj with a good left hook, but he, he didn't go nowhere. What? You know, so when I came back to the corner, I heard him once again. See, I told you, I say, but it's all right. We, 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 I got him tired. We're going to be all right. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, I was a little nervous about that, but we went on and forth because Roger was one of the best fighters out there at that particular mm -hmm. time, even though he was going a little downhill. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Other little things was happening with him far as, like, you know, uh, he was going through some trials and tribulations and things like that. But he had sugar and things, like that, which you know what he died from. Yeah, you know, yeah, 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 unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, let's talk about Freddie Pendleton. Pendleton. Okay. Now, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, back in 2007, I think I was doing <laughs> this show, <laughs> and, and I tried to get that, that, that bout happening. You and Freddie Pendleton. Yeah. Now, he was talking all kinds of Trash. You yes, already yeah. know. He said, "Oh, he don't want to see me. Yeah, he don't want to." He's a trash talker. Yeah, <laughs> he's a trash talker. Yeah. You know, I no. was always cool, calm, collected. I never talk trash. I just try to let my hands do the talk. So, how was that fight? Give, give me that, from that, one to ten. That, that particular fight. We even starting off with that fight. I have forgot my record. You know, my record is busting loose. Mm -hmm. And at that particular time. I did not know that Chuck Brown was out there in the audience and this and that and all that stuff. And you know, I didn't have the bus loose, so that sort of helped me back. But with Freddie Pendleton, I thought I would get him up all that round about <laughs> even five or seven rounds, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. he got it from the canvas. <laughs> and, and I was like, whoa, you know, so I, I found myself on the canvas. <laughs> About nine to ten from there, I said, man, yeah, he come to rumble. Uh, so I said, oh, man, Lord have mercy. <laughs> so I got a little cut here. Mm -hmm. It's on one of my eyes, and I forgot the guy that was referring the fight. I said, man, I got three minutes. You got to give me this three minutes. So you mean to tell me Freddie gave you that cut? Yeah, he, he oh, I don't okay. know if it was from an elbow punch I, I or think, whatever. I think that's from. what he was bragging on. I, yeah, you know, I don't I, know if it was from an elbow punch or whatever, but uh -huh. I got a little cut. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, not, and I told the ref, I forgot the ref name, mm -hmm. but I still see him around the time. I said, man, it's three minutes. Let me go with this three minutes, man. Just let me, let me right, get right. back to my corner. Oh, no, it's ice me. I can't do that. I got to stop this fight because they cut. Now, I had a worse cut than that mm -hmm. when I fought Reggie Green. Mm -hmm. You know, Tyson, this has been such an honor. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed your stories, and um, I appreciate you coming out here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I really well, appreciate one, be, Before we get off the ass, one thing I wanted to say to you was that uh, you, used to gave, you gave some great shows yourself, you know, and there was one <laughs> show you gave with uh, Clarence Vincent. Which we call Adam. Well, that was one you of know, your guys you trained. That was just one of the guys Adam I trained in that, in that particular fight, you know. And I was telling him, it's a good show that she's giving and doing and everything. We're going to do what we got to do to get But he didn't show. make weight. Yeah, okay. Well, me and Ty was just talking about that on the way coming over here. And, uh, I was I didn't I was, bring it up, but you brought it up. I was trying to think, where was that fight at? And it was, it was at, it was it was Bird, at the Lincoln Theater. No, no. It was, it was at Howard University. Okay, Bird Howard University. That, that's, that's where that's it was. That's where it was. I was trying to remember where that's it was. That's where it was, Howard and University. And I had him at his weight. I say, just go home, draw at him and everything. No, just, no, I'm going to take you with me. Nah, I'm, I'm going to go home with my mother. I don't know why I let him do that. Long John's never and got him a steak and cheese or something. Uh. He come over three, four, four. Where I say, I can't trust you no more, man. I, I can't deal with it. But you know what he did? He did try to lose weight that night. Yeah. The, at when? He did try no, to do no, it. No, that night he had the weight. I mean, you know, whatever the day, the day, no, the night before. He, he had the weight. Because I, I had left. I started to take him with me. But oh, I, I had really when he came home. back, you mean? Yeah, then okay. he was three, four pound old. I said, what did you do? Is, well, I had me a steak and cheese. I said, well, that go your way right there. But the thing is, he won the fight, and he, he looked good. He won the good, fight hands down. He looked good. He looked, and, and I'm he looked looking, excellent. But the fact that he was so drained, you could see everything out of him. He was really drained. Yeah, and he I, was drained, and I was drained with him, because yeah. I wanted that belt. <laughs> I, I know. I, you think yeah. I didn't want it to promote it? You think yeah, I didn't I, need I, that? I, I, absolutely. I was like, so come was, on. You got to be kidding me. I was so upset. But, you know, things happen. You know, he, he still came through. He won the fight, and so that's, that's important, you know? Well, so. You know, and, 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 and before we get off the air, as you know, a lot of people know around Washington, D.C., that, uh, you know, Tyrone Johnson was one hell of a promoter here in D.C., mm -hmm. and uh, he did a lot for D.C. coming out as promoting things like that, so, you know, everything. Went and he had the Madness connection? I mean, yeah, that was the first one that had Madness on the back of my shirt. <laughs> no, everybody in D.C. had Madness. That was the first one. <laughs> I was the first one. Go up that right up on Georgia. Yeah. I think it's Georgia Avenue. Yeah, Georgia Avenue, that's right. <laughs> <laughs>
That's right. Yeah, oh, my God. I can go on and on and on with you, Tyson. Yeah, all day long. It's a good, that's a good thing, baby. Yeah, yeah. Always all right. well, a pleasure. Thanks again for being here. Yeah, and always we got to get off now. this air. Thank okay, you so no much. Problem. We'll be right back with The Right <laughs> Hook Show. <laughs> Everything for we ain't even Chinese. Box, I stand bread like nine feet. And I wish you'd try me. I be there with baby. I be there with baby. Yeah, I be there with baby. I be there with baby. Yeah, I be there with baby. I be there with baby. Yeah, I be there with baby. So you can stop the hate. She's a boxing promoter and you know a soldier. She work with big. Thank you for tuning back into the Right Hook Show. We're here with Andre Johnson, the guitar player for Rare Essence. I'm so excited to get a chance to talk to this man, this young man. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, Mr. Johnson, how long have you been with the, uh, the, the Rare Essence band? Well, I'm one of the founding members, so I've been there for 45, 46 years now. Ooh, yeah. that's a long time. Yeah, so now we started when we were young. <laughs> ten years old, ten, eleven years old when we started. So, because I don't want you to think I'm seventy, but you know, <laughs> we've, we've been there for a while. No, so, so at that age, did you? Who showed you how to play the guitar? Did you go to school? Did you? Well, did you? I learned from a few guys that were living in the neighborhood at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they would show me things from you know time to time, and then as I got older. I took lessons. Wow, that's mm -hmm. that's amazing. And and the, give me give me your definition of the go go sound. What is the go go sound? Well, it's uh, all live live instruments: drums, congos, cymbales, keyboards, guitars, horns, and singers. And um, it's uh, heavily influenced on the percussion end. So the uh, the drums, congos, cymbales, cowbells, and all that never stops. I love the cowbells, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it, just, it just keeps going and going. And what makes it unique is um, once we start, we don't stop until it's like time to take a break or maybe the show's over. It's like nonstop, it's nonstop. Like nonstop, we go from one song to the next, to the next, to the next. And do, do you guys, um, with the go-go music, are you always, I don't know if sampling is the, the correct w word, Sampling music that are the R and B's and all that. No, well, no. How, how's that? No. The, um, well, as it's evolved, there are different types of band. There are bands that just do cover songs and and you know band and do original. So we came from the original era. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of. We have a lot of our own original songs, but then we also do covers in between. Whichever song is popular on the radio that we know the audience is going to like, mm -hmm. we'll do our version of it, mm -hmm. and they like it even more. Yeah, and, and I was looking at doing some research. You guys had the uh, Work the Walls. Yes. That went national, correct? That was national, yes. How was that? What was that feeling when you guys, or was that the first one to go national? Maybe well, the national. first one that went national was the very first record, which was Body Moves in 1981. That one went national. And how did you guys? How did you guys feel about that? I had to be some. It, 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 it was it was really exciting, but again, at that time we were teenagers, so we didn't, didn't really grasp in. what what was really going on. Um, but uh, we we've had quite a few records to to do national. How many is in the the band? The original band. How many members did you have? The original band we had about twelve members. Ooh. Yes, yeah, big band. So, so when you guys were that young, I mean, you were, you were actually go around to different places to perform. You had to have your mom, your dads. I mean, how did that work? Actually, the moms of the drummer, uh, Foots, uh, Quentin Foots Davidson and James Funk Thomas. Mm -hmm. And then the other mom of Ms. Mrs. Neal, uh, Michael Neal, Funky Ned. Mm -hmm. Their moms served as, the, as managers and chauffeurs and guardians and everything else. So wow, that's incredible. So even though your, your, your music went national, you guys are always considered yourselves home base, correct? Well, we- In, in a sense that- Yeah, we, we've kept that connection with, with the uh, DMV audience, yes. And then when you go, when you make, like you had a song out with, I believe, Snoop Dogg. Mm -hmm. Recently. Yep. Recently, what was that like? I mean, what was the- First of all, how did that come about? When when you guys mm -hmm. do something like that, when you have um, 
a high, uh, I guess, a high-ranking performer like Snoop Dogg, mm -hmm. how do you get that co collab going on? Is it when you well, call him up or well, you got the idea in your head? How does that work? <laughs> no, the song came about from an Instagram post that he did uh, of him listening to one of our songs called Hey Buddy Buddy. Really? He's driving around, just driving and listening to it. And when we first saw that, I was like, well, you know, the internet can make you seem like you're doing anything. Right. Um, but then there's a part in the song where James Funk says, uh, oh, you ready now, ain't you? And Snoop repeated that. Snoop mm -hmm. said, oh, you ready now, ain't you? On the Instagram post. So I was like, okay, you really listening to it. Oh, I reached wow. out to my man in LA, uh, works at Interscope Records, and I said, yo, did you see the post? He was like, yeah, uh, what you want to do? I said, contact him, see if he'd be interested in doing a collaboration. He called me back later on that night and said, yeah, Snoop is into it. Oh my God. And then we ended up putting it together. Well, how was it working with him? It was great. Snoop is a professional. Snoop is, the, you know, very entertaining all the time. <laughs> so, I mean, he just comes in and he's, you know, uh, nice to everybody in the room and he just comes in and has a good time. He's just enjoying being Snoop Dogg. You know? Right. Let me ask you about this. When you guys, when it's just rare essence, when you go into the studio, does it take you months to create a song? I mean, what's what's the format like and how, did, how does that work? No, what we do is we uh, formulate the song in rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in the studio, you're on the clock. So, you know, you got to pay about an hour, oh, okay. 50 $75 an hour. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to pay that money to be practicing in the <laughs> studio. We practice, we do that at rehearsal. Mm -hmm. And when we got it tight enough, then we take it to the studio. We learned that from Chuck Brown. Cool. He produced the first record, the Body Moves record. He produced that record. And he told us, you know, when you practicing, Mm -hmm. Your record, you do that at practice. Mm -hmm. You don't go in the studio when you're on the clock. And if you ain't getting it right, not getting it right, then it's costing you more and more money. So we would practice it first, and then when we got, once we got it well enough, we take it into the studio and record it. So when you do you guys rehearse, did you have to because you guys are so uh, such pros? Does it still require you to practice often? Well, not as often as years ago, but we do have to rehearse. Um, because there's certain, we're always coming up with something different. Mm -hmm. And some of the stuff we can, we can do, come up with it right there on stage because there's a lot of songs that we do that with. Mm -hmm. But then some of it requires rehearsal where, you know, we got to try a few things before we try it out on the audience because they will let you know if they don't like it. <laughs> so what sets Rare Essence apart from all the other Go-Go bands? Well, the fact that we've been, um, consistently performing for the entire 45 years. Uh, during this pandemic is the most time that we've ever been on, ever. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, usually, you know, we're on, you know, two, three times a week, every week of the year. So we've been able to do that. Plus, you know, we've had a you know bunch of uh, different unique players. Uh, James Funk is a unique player. He's a, a, a vocalist does more like an MC to the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, Lil Benny, he's mm -hmm. part of, he was part of one of the original members of Red Essence. Um, Donnell Floyd, mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, 911, Team Familiar, Familiar Faces. He's, uh, he was a member. Um, Jungle Boogie is the Congo player, his name is Tyrone Williams. He's the one that everybody, every Congo player around here patterns their style after. What, what, what's the style like? I mean, what, what? It is a Afro, more of an Afro-centric style. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. more of the African rhythms. Um, when Chuck Brown started, he was using more Latin rhythms mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because of his affiliation with the uh, Los Latinos. Mm -hmm. um, he was using Latin rhythms. Tyrone Jungle Boogie was using African rhythms, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he Foots and David Green kind of blended that their sounds, being on the drums and the cowbells and timbales, they blended the sound and made it, you know, uniquely ours. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So, are all the members n native DC or no? Uh, or it, it depends. It just yeah, all, everybody is from either DC or Maryland. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they know, they probably grew up with Go-Go, yep. you know, in terms of the, with the ones now, mm -hmm. you know, versus the ones that were there. Yep. They, so did you guys emulate yourselves after Chuck Brown or 
No, you just yeah. got... So no, everybody in Go-Go, especially the early ones, emulated what Chuck was doing. Mm -hmm. What we did was called him and got permission from him mm -hmm. to say, hey, look, we like the way that you put your songs together. Because he told us uh, the reason he did that was because he wanted to, once you get the people on the floor, mm -hmm. Um, you don't want to stop so they can go sit down and then you got to try to get them back up again. Oh. So he would start the next song immediately and then just keep the people on the floor. That's how you end up going from one song to the next to the next to the next. But so that, that brings up another question. So how is that? Your stamina, in terms of the band members, your stamina has to be on point. Yeah, yeah, yeah you do. Especially the drummer. <laughs> Because oh the drummer God! Never stops. He's he's always playing, so he he never stops. But I mean, we we used to it. That's what we've been doing for decades now. So what is what's what's on the agenda for Rare? Since I mean, you guys got the the, the song just came out with Snoop Dogg. That's that's big. So mm -hmm. what else? Are, what Rare since going? We have a, a three more high profile uh, collaborations that we've done. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really say who they are right, right now, just, I got you. just yet, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but we have three more of those. We're trying to secure two others, mm -hmm. and then we're going to put out uh, a new either EP or LP later this year with all of those songs, as well as um, we got uh, we're we're in the process of doing another PA a PA tape. That's more like our mixtape, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know. So so we we're, we're in the process of, of putting that together. We're going to put that out. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a couple of uh, some some high profile shows. We're doing the uh, Rare Essence reunion. Really? Um, at on September 18th at the MGM. Wait, uh, in Maryland? Nas no, yeah, National Harbor. National Harbor. Are you serious? That's yeah. gonna be. So it's gonna be all. It's gonna be like 35 musicians. You know, from. 40 years Whoa. Um, coming in and off and then the finale is going to be everybody out there together. That's going to be beautiful. Yeah, oh be God, I should can't really wait out. to see that. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Go-Go, um, you, you guys went national, but the overall Go-Go sound has never really got that break. You, you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And why do you think that is? A lot of it is due to the music executives Back in the day, if you wanted a record deal, you had to go to New York. Mm -hmm. um, the New York music executives didn't understand the sound here. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know how to market and promote the records across the country. Mm -hmm. Inside the area, they knew, and we didn't even need them here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We just needed them outside of here. But um, they didn't understand how to promote it because they kept trying to change it. Instead of making it you know, pure go-go, they want to mix it with hip-hop or mix it with this sound or that sound. And because they understood those sounds, mm -hmm, they just mm -hmm. didn't understand what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So we felt like um, because they didn't understand it, they didn't know how to promote it and they just didn't want to deal with it. It's, it's, it's crazy because you can go anywhere in the country, I, I, I would imagine, and someone would be playing go-go. Maybe they were from D.C., that mm -hmm. migrated to California or wherever. There's a lot of that. They, they know about it. Mm -hmm. And, well, specifically in Virginia, Petersburg, Virginia, my cousin calls me mm -hmm. constantly about CD taste for mm -hmm. I said, wait a minute, CDs, do they even bake those right. anymore? <laughs> <laughs> right. I said, can't you just go online and get your, mm -hmm. your music? And can you guys do that? Can people do that now? Yes, yes. We, we are on all streaming platforms. Um, YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, we, I mean, we're out there. Wow, I mean, God, this has just been a pleasure, Andre. I'm mm -hmm. like, thank you so much thank you. for showing up, coming here, and um, if you, you have anything else you want to tell us about you got going on, I know you just said those three collaborations you got going on, mm -hmm. something else that we, and you got the thing going on at MGM. The MGM is the biggest the thing. The biggest that, thing. That is, I mean, that's huge. It, it, we've been putting that together for two years. Wow. Um, well, I can to, imagine with all the, the members. All the members and, and, you know, different things that we're going to do that's going to happen during the show. So, yeah. So, we, so what, you, what do you mean during the show? We, we, well, I mean, that is, that's not us playing. It's us playing and there are other things going on. It's oh, going to be a show. It's, it's going to be, be a be show. like a real show. Wow. Man, you got me intrigued. Mm -hmm. I want to go see. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, thank you so much, Andre. It was a pleasure. Andre Johnson with Rare Essence. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll see you the next time on the Right Hook Show.
about to show these little I go. Pay attention, you should stay and learn. Turned up in the club, nigga. You know I came here with baby girl. B-A-B-I-E. Everything foreign, we ain't even Chinese. Box, I stand bread like nine.